Hello, my name is Didier Collot. I'm professor of physics at the University of Cambridge and uh, at ETH Zurich. And uh, my field of research is planet and stars. And recently, I quite get interested to look for life in the universe. Good evening and welcome. You join us, of course, for the fifth Darwin College lecture on the theme of revolution. I'm wonderful once again to see a packed lecture theater. Uh, this week, our speaker is Professor Didier Kelu. He is a professor of physics here at the University of Cambridge in the Cavendish Laboratory and a fellow of Trinity College, one of the three founding colleges of Darwin College 60 years ago. Uh, Didier's work, he, well, he works really at the very origin of the exoplanet revolution in astrophysics. He obtained a PhD from the University of Geneva in astrophysics, where he still holds uh, a professorship as well as here at Cambridge. And he was also the founding director of uh, the Center for the Origin and Prevalence of Life at ETH Zurich. He's co-authored over 400 papers, I think, uh, in astrophysics, and in 2017, he was awarded the Wolf Prize in Physics. In 2019, he was a joint winner of the Nobel Prize in Physics, and in 2020, he was elected as a Fellow of the Royal Society here in the UK. Uh, the reason he was a co-winner of the Nobel Prize uh, was because he discovered, along with uh, Michel uh, Mayer, the first giant planet outside our solar system. And that spawned a real revolution in astronomy, both in terms of the new instrumentation, but also our understanding of how planets are formed and how they evolve. In my field, people with such fame usually have a species of animal or plant named after them. But of course, in Didier's case, it's a small planet. Asteroid 177415, I believe. Not quite as attractive a name as some of the plants and animals that I... But anyway, um, here at Cambridge, he now leads a comprehensive research program uh, with the goal of enhancing our understanding of the formation, the structure, the habitability of exoplanets in the universe. And as well, he puts a lot of time and effort into sharing the excitement of his work with the public. So I can think of nobody better to deliver this lecture this evening on the exoplanet revolution. Please join me in welcoming Professor Caleb. Well, thank you very much. I mean, this is a, this is a wonderful welcome. Um, it's a very interesting place for me here because when I moved to, this, to Cambridge 10 years ago, I gave my first public lecture in this hall, so I was quite excited to be back now uh, with even more stories to tell you about. So what I will share with you is uh, my world, is uh, the world of planet, but I will also um, try to convey to you this message that we are living a very extraordinary moment right now in the history of science that some of us qualify as a true evolution. And um, I will explain this to you, and I will also show you that this evolution is nothing compared to what may be ahead of us. And I will be starting talking about planets and then moving gradually into the question of life in the universe. Now, that's a program for, for tonight. So let's start about planet and star. So for those of you not familiar with uh, how astrophysics works, essentially, the unit in astrophysics we are talking about is the stars. And that's what we see. They tend to cluster into galaxies, and the galaxies, there's many galaxies. There's a lot of very fascinating physics going around in the universe. But at the end of it, the unit is the stars. But the star uh, has a story as well. I mean, uh, you don't start with a star like that. You have to make it. And uh, the star is being made by one of these um, original component of the universe, which is the hydrogen. So usually we have hydrogen that in the form of cloud. We call that molecular cloud. They're huge. They're million times larger than the size of the solar system. And for some reason, which is related to the gravity, to the instability, some of these clouds, they collapse. And in this collapse, they create, um, most of the time, 
um, series of stars. I say series because they look like clusters or associations, and it's not only one. Um, and these stars, around them, they are something else. And the reason why they are something else is because of a very simple law of physics, which is when we have something rotating, it creates a concept called angular momentum. And you cannot really get rid of it. That's something you have to store. And the very natural way to get rid of it when you build the star is to assemble into a disk. And in this disk, to have something being made of, which are planets. So in a sense, when you're talking about planets, you're talking about the stories which is connecting you with the stars. And that is really something that is interesting, interesting to keep in mind here, because I will be coming back on that. So the idea that the sun is a star, it's an idea that took some time um, to understand. The story of the planet is very old, actually. I mean, the idea that there are planetas and come from the Greek, something that moves around, uh, it's something that starts very early on from the time that the mankind uh, was really looking at the sky. I mean, in the, the species, it's certainly one of the very first things that you could do at night is just looking at the stars. There were no light. Uh, and then find out this, this planet. So the planets would be in a very special um, with the moon, and they are connected to many uh, myths. And this is the reason why we have uh, seven days of the week. There's a lot of connections with that. I don't want to give you all the story here. But what is interesting here is it took us a really long time to um, build the story together. What is the connection between the planet, how exactly the planet are moving around um, in, the, in the solar system? And we have here famous names of Newton here in, this, in these institutions that brought us the key to understand the, the magic of the motions. Um, and then to just try to understand exactly how the solar system fit in. So it's already there. We're talking about a series of different revolutions. It's a revolution from the time you realize that the sun has a specific locations and not the Earth. And then the time when you realize that the solar system as, it's, as, it, as a structure is a structure orbiting a star, but there are plenty of other stars, and there are plenty of other stars into galaxies. So all this have moved around the concept of where we're sitting and the way we see ourselves. Now, what has changed in the last 30 years is from the time where we had the stars and the galaxies, there were clearly no element, um, obvious element, to tell us about what about planet orbiting other stars. The concept was pretty obvious. There must be, because we have planet orbiting that star, or sun, and due to this mechanism of protoplanetary disk, um, you have to have, in a way, planet on other stars. So it was considered as obvious. Um, there must be planet orbiting other stars. And you go back to the 19th century, you see, um, I think, um, scientists explaining uh, how um, likely it is. And you are later on have the concept of even living organism on Mars, on Venus, the Martian, the Venusians, all this. So it was kind of into the mind of everybody until the time when people start to find out, but practically, how do you make planet? So then you move from the concept that there must be a disk into how you make a planet. And that took a long time until uh, building an um, understanding of making a planet itself into a disk is not something which is obvious. It was such that 100 years ago, some people even challenged that the likelihood to have a planet orbiting a stars, because you would need at that time the concept of collision of stars, which is very rare to happen. So, so all this idea, and I just want to go through that with you, just know it's so easy, because we have this understanding of what it is. But when you go back in time, the concept of how we're sitting as a planetary system is not something which is obvious. So the beauty of astrophysics is I think astrophysics has experienced, I would say, the golden age in the last 30, 50 years with new equipment. And these new equipment are kind of magical because we can make picture of things far away and we can really resolve and th see things. So one of the pictures that was, I think, one of this landmark in astrophysics is when we were able to take a picture of one of these protoplanetary disks I was talking about. So this picture is 
very complicated to do because you need to use antenna, which is located in the Altiplano in Chile at 5,000 meters. You need to use many antennas together. This is called ALMA. You need to combine the information of all this radio, and that's part of this work has been possible thanks to people here in the Cavendish that created the concept of combining um, the information between telescopes. And at the end, you rebuild the image. And this is a very young star that we call HL Tau. Tau is for the Taurus, I mean the constellation. And what you do see here is the thermal emission. So think about a, a thermal picture of you. You know all these thermal camera you can buy right now. And that's exactly the same. But that's a thermal picture of a structure in the universe, not so far away. And the fact we see it is because it's hot compared to the background. The background is cold. It's the universe. It's very cold. And we see this. And it's hot because the star in the middle is shining onto the disk. And it's just warming a little bit the disk, which here is made of tiny zillions of particles. And these particles are just shining to you. And that's why we see it. So this picture is fascinating because what we do see here is it's not only a disk, but that's a disk with a structure. We have these kind of grooves there. And this structure has a very good reason to be there because a lot of dynamical motion is going on. Something is happening in this disk. And the reason why we have this structure is because there are planets being built right now in this disk. This star is about 20 million years. So the moment when you make planet around a star is very early on. It happened on the first 10 to 50, 100 million years, and then that's done. And the solar system has more than four and a half billion years. So it gives you all this time scale. This is what is happening here. So we know that this is happening on other stars. Now, what is fascinating with this, and I want to show you another picture, a very emblematic stars, which is called Beta Pic, which in this case, it's not a thermal image that I did, it's an image that has been done with the Hubble Space Telescope. So in that case, let's look at the one on the top. Not to have too much light from the star, uh, this picture has been blocked. This is the reason why you have this dark cycle in the middle, so you don't see the stars. And what you do see is the shining light from the disk. But in that case, the disk is not seen anymore face on. It's seen on the edge. That's why you have this very narrow strip here. I show you this picture to show you how thin is a disk orbiting a star. And the fact it is thin is one of the ingredients why you make planet. If you're thin, you mean all the material is very much close to each other. They're bumping into each other. By bumping, they are sticking to each other, and then you make the planet. Now, the picture on the top is usually what we call the solids, because only the solids are shining to you. They reflect the light from the stars. The picture on the bottom is the very same scale, exactly the same scale, but we're using a completely different tool which is a radio telescope in that case, a similar radio telescope I showed you before. And we make a map of the gas that is there in the disk. There are gas. It's full of hydrogen. There is also other gas there. And the reason why I show you this is to show you that there is a mixing between the two, between the gas and the solid. Now, this picture on the bottom is quite interesting for an astrophysicist because you first see that the gas is way more thicker, so it's not that thin compared to the solids. This is related to the property that the gas has to sustain the pressure. It's called the hydrostatic equilibrium. It's the reason why. But something more critical here, you see it is not that extended that the disk of solids. And that's not a feature from the image. It's not because the technology does not picture it. It's really there is a cut into the gas. And the reason why there is a cut to some distances, because it becomes too cold. When you are next to the star, it's hot. When you go away from the star, it becomes cold. And because it becomes cold, it's like for the water, at some point it becomes snow, it becomes solids. So in that case, it's CO2 you have here, or CO. The CO becomes solid. So it's not any more gas. Since you have way more gas than solids, about 100 times, you have a lot of snow particle, if you want to call it snow, sitting on the edge of the disk. So most, most of the stuff into a disk that is gluing together to make the planet are actually sitting on the outside of the disk, not on the inside. 
And this is the reason why, because of this, that we have the giant planet outside. Because they are much bigger, they need to be made much faster, and they need to, get, to grab way more solid stuff to assemble the core and to trap the rest of the gas. And that picture is the foundations of the planet modeling that we had built until 1995. Because what has happened in 95 is everybody had an image, including us, when we started the program to look for planet, that most of the planet, most of the big planet like Jupiter, would be sitting on the outside of the system, like or Jupiter and Saturn. They are just on the outside compared to uh, Mars, uh, Venus, and the Earth, which are much smaller. And the idea to detect them was, OK, we need to find this planet, so let's find a machine. Let's build a machine that's going to find them. The machine was using a very simple principle. If you have an orbital planet, it will change a little bit the motion of the stars. It will create a change of the, the speed of the star, which is called the radial velocity. So we need to build a machine that is very sensitive able to detect that, and that was my job to do this machine. So the machine was really revolutionary. It was a new kind of machine get, that has the property to detect that kind of motions. And of course, when this program started, it was in 94, I think they were not in single expectation by me as a PhD student to find any planet. Because this picture was everybody had in mind. The big planet like Jupiter are outside. And because they're outside, it takes 10 years, 15 years for them to orbit the stars. But if you want to detect a motion related from the stars on the, pl on, on, um, the motion from the planet on the stars, it's going to take 10 years, essentially, a minimum. So it's really beyond what a PhD student can do. But that's far as fine. Um, I was so proud that I built a machine that could do that. In science, you sometimes you just be part of the long series of experimental work, and it's time to develop uh, the output of the science. That's OK. I started the program. My supervisor was so sure that we would not get anything that even left in sabbatical at that time. Gave me the key of the equipment. <laughs> this is really what happened. So for me, it was really nice. It was because I could have fun. I could do whatever I wanted with the machine. I could collect all the data I wanted for my PhD. And I can tell you, it wasn't an easy ride when I started observing one star that was 51 peg. Because that star didn't do exactly what I had in mind, actually just the opposite. Every time I would measure that star, the value I would get out of my software, all the equipment I had, would change. And that is not possible, because the star are like moving objects on a straight line on the scale of a couple of years in the galaxies. You don't see anything. The only way to see something is because there is something orbiting around some, something else. And that star was supposed to be single. Nothing was orbiting that star. And I was shocked when I started to see all the data jumping uh, after uh, w one night after another one. And at that moment, I can sincerely tell you, I thought that something was really wrong with the machine. And it was a panic moment, because you can imagine you work three years building an equipment, building the software. You're responsible for running the program. Your PhD supervisor is in the other side of the, of the world. I mean, really, because he was in Hawaii at that time. So I mean, and, and in 95, there were no, barely email. And I just, I have to fix the problem. I mean, this was my problem. I had to fix it. And I battled with this data. I went, I did a lot of tests, compared with other stars. I came observing one month later. It always took time, because you, always, you cannot always have access to the telescopes and so on. And that sometimes I gave up. I said, well, there is no mistake. It is real. And when you make this twist in your mind, what practically you have to consider is if it's real, so what it is about. And I went into all the possible scenarios. And the only one I came up with is a planet. It's a planet of the mass of Jupiter, about, but then with an orbit of four days. And it was really a shocking way of news. But you know, you young, you PhD students, you don't really realize what is going to happen. So you say, well, it must be a planet. <laughs> so let's tell my supervisor that I found a planet. <laughs> I, I made a fax. I sent him this. And uh, he was very kind. I mean, it's always my advice to other PhD students. Be kind, whatever happened, because you never know. He said, yeah, maybe. And anyway, I'll come back in one month. So just leave this aside, and we'll see together when I'll be back. When he came back, he really clearly didn't believe me. 
But I just explained what I did, and at some point he said, well, yeah, I mean, I, I see why you believe it may be a planet. And the time going on, he realized that that was the only explanation. It took him a bit of time to realize that was the only explanation. Went back then a couple of months later, this time together, reobserving the stars. After I made a prediction, I said, look, Michel, I mean, if this is real, this is my prediction. And um, let's come back in July, uh, because the star will, will be up again. And we went there, and it was like a dream. I mean, we had a telescope every night, and first data point, bing, on the prediction. Second one, bing, the third one, bing. And we say, oh, maybe it's one one piece of luck. Second one, still luck. And then the fourth one, we say, up on the champagne. That's what it is. <laughs> and then the problem started. Because we were convinced that it was a planet, but we were the only one. Because this planet didn't make any sense for most of the community. So we ran to the publication. It was a tough battle. We barely got published at the end. We finally got it, but it was really a battle. We made the announcement, and frankly, very few people believed that. Only few realized the consequence of this finding. So why so? Because this theory is wrong, actually. That was a big problem. We changed completely the situations. So for a couple of years, essentially, nobody believed us. And I can tell you it's not an easy, an easy situation. And when I'm being asked, oh, what did you feel when you find the planet? I say, well, I didn't feel very well. I started enjoying 10 years later. Because for five years, it was really tough until it was obvious that there are something really going on that we don't understand. So what is this something we don't understand? Is this theory is hugely incomplete. Because the situation in terms of planet that we have right now is this. So this is the period. This is the radius. Again, the period and the mass. The planet 51 peg B is sitting somewhere on the top left over there. Radius and period and radius mass. Uh, they're over there. Uh, but that's not the only one being strange. We have also plenty of other planets we're detecting right now. We have been detected with the size and mass. Oh, the size, by the way, is detected by transit. So when you have a, a transiting planet, when the planet goes in front of the, uh, of the stars, it creates a bit of a decrease of the light from the stars. It's how you get the size. Of, uh, of the planet. Uh, and we have other planets, plenty of other planets as well, which are in a Neptune size, in Earth size, in Neptune mass, Earth mass. You see all of them that have short period. You need five days, this is 10 days, this is 100 days, and it's very, very bizarre. And if you compare this planet with the one in the solar system, they don't match. You see the Earth? It's over there. You see Venus? You see Jupiter? So we have a mismatch into the planet that we have found in the last 30 years and the one we have in the solar system. So if there is one thing to remember about that, and one thing we have learned, well, is first there are plenty of planets, but then most of the planets we have detected, they don't look like the solar system. And that is a kind of a revolution in astrophysics because you don't always have encounter in this situation when the whole theory, the whole space you've built up, the whole understanding you have based on what you have, the data you have, which is the solar system, give you just a tiny bit of the answer, but the answer is much more complicated. The usual comparison I'm making is you believe you're a biologist and you study your garden and your garden is full of roses and you make a theory that the universe is full of roses. And one day you move to the, whatever, forest or any place and you realize there's plenty of other flowers and plenty of other trees because it's, it is, you're missing a bit. It's exactly the same. So in the formation mechanism, we completely missed a lot of event that is going on at the time you form the planet into the disk. So there is connection between the disk and the planet, and all this can be moving around. And you can make a planet somewhere, and the planet would move around. And depending the exact situation in the disk, the exact dynamical um, um, physics, you would just change the location of the planet. And that change have a lot of dramatic consequences. The, one of the consequences, if you use all these discoveries you have here, and you try to get some some comparison with the solar system, the first one you have is practically the technology we're using today can barely detect the solar system. In the transit, when we take the transit, the sensitivity of the techniques for 30 years would detect only anything on the left, nothing on the right. So practically, if you look for Earth on Jupiter, on Venus using the transit, which is the techniques, you would not have found any. So in the, in the radial velocity, which is being used to get the mass, then it's not that bad, and you would have found the Jupiter, but certainly not the Earth and Venus. It's something we cannot detect. So I used to call that the gift of nature, because nature was way more complicated and way more diverse into forming planets than we thought, which means that 
despite the technology that was not very up to speed to detect the system similar to us, or barely in the one over there, um, we found a lot of others. So that's kind of, this is sometimes called surprise in science. And there's a lot of big discovery that are changing completely the paradigm in science that came out of the blue. Because you have the equipment, you can do things, you build the equipment to do something, and then you find something else. And this something else is even bigger and more interesting than what you thought. So what is interesting right now is actually how do we fit in in terms of solar system? So this answer is difficult because we don't have any discoveries which is the same. But we can partially have it by running statistics. If you use all these discoveries, if I look at the stars tonight, if you see the stars, and ask myself, what is the likelihood, so it's just statistics, that I have any of this kind of group of planets orbiting a star, this is the answer. So if you look at the hot Jupiter, the one on the top, that's all hot Jupiter, because they're Jupiter, they're close to the stars, so they're hot, because there's a lot of illumination from the stars, 1 to 5%. So it's kind of a, not that common. So 51 peg B, in a way, was not that common, but we made the discovery because we had a, a list of stars much larger than any attempt in the past. The first attempt in the 70s had about a dozen stars. We had 140 stars. That's why we found. Actually, we had two hot Jupiter in the sample. So we had to find them. People ask me, was it a piece of luck? I say, well, the piece of luck if nature was kind with us, but we had to find them because statistics tell us it, they were in the sample. So they were there waiting for us, in a sense. Now, what is fascinating here is uh, when you look at the other group of planets that usually we call these days um, super-Earth or mini-Neptunes because they're sitting in a regime that is the size of the Earth or mass of the Earth and Neptunes, it's more than 50%, more than up to 80%, 80%. So it means the majority of the planet orbiting the stars are like that. They're not like us. So we are a little bit special. Are we very special or just special? I don't know. Uh, maybe we're just special because if you look at the 10% of the Jupiter, you can see maybe this Jupiter is giving us a hint that we're detecting the Jupiter or something that if you look at, you may find an Earth later on. So the end, at the end of that, maybe we're going to find out that the chance to get a solar system in a similar situation than us is just a few percent in the galaxy which give us plenty, I remind you, we have 100 billion stars in the galaxy. So I give you 1 billion solar system, then, if this is 1%. So it's okay. Now, what is fascinating here is when you connect the two, mass and the size, as a physicist, you build what's called the planetology. And uh, in the solar system, we have a limited number of planets. We have eight to play with. Um, and leaving, uh, I mean, Pluto a bit aside. Uh, no, we have an infinite number, and you can build a density diagram like that. So you combine the size and the mass of the planet, you build this diagram, you compare with planets in the solar system, and you realize that we have a very limited number of situations which is being experienced by nature in the solar system. We essentially have the giant planet over there, though we have hundreds of them. They're slightly more um, bigger, larger, because they're hot, so they change a little bit the nature of what they are. Um, we have a lot of planets between Saturn and Neptune, uh, with different nature of density, so we're not exactly sure exactly what they're made of. Uh, we have planets that are rocky like the Earth. They are just there, 1-1, one, one, 10 to 0, 10 to 0 is 1-1, one, one, one Earth mass, one Earth radius. The green line is if you maintain the density which is rocky-like, you will be sitting along this line. So any, any data point which is along this green line corresponds to rocky planets. So we do have a dozen of planets that would qualify as rocky, I know. But we have also all these strange objects that along the blue line, blue line corresponds to water-like planet, which is a bit denser than Neptune's. We don't really know what they are, uh, but they exist. So they're all this mixing between a rocky planet and a kind of a Neptune. We're talking about this super ocean planet when you have a planet like the Earth, but an ocean, maybe a 2,000 kilometers on the top of the planet. So all this is possible. And uh, it's just the beginning of that. We are just amazed by the diversity of the planet orbiting other stars. And that has completely changed the field in such a way that when we were doing that, we were maybe a dozen of 
I mean, uh, as an alien scientist looking for, for planet, really, very doing bizarre stuff. Right now, uh, there is a meeting in the field happening in Leiden, and there is 750 attendees. So just to grow the field is just unbelievable. So there is really an interest because this is a new stuff. So in that sense, by detecting the first planet and by having the first planet being a bit bizarre was even more fascinating and interesting that having a final planet would be like the solar system because it has developed a complete new uh, dimension trying to understand all of this. Now, what is interesting with all these the discoveries is the fact that we have a lot of short period planet. That was completely unexpected. The short period planet, they are nice because they have a high chance to get a transit. The closest you are from the star, the highest is your chance to be aligned exactly and for a brief moment to go in front of the stars. This is why we have so many size being found. That's how we can build this diagram here. But what we're doing with the transit is even more, is even better. That is why there is so much interest right now by this transiting planet. You may have heard about the TESS mission. You may have heard about James Webb Space Telescope observing these systems. Because when you access a transiting planet, it creates a very interesting situations that you can use to get even more information about the planet itself and dealing with the atmosphere of the planet. How it works is the following. When you have the, the transit is when you have the planet in front of you. Well, what you have to think about is imagine the planet with a thick layer of atmosphere. So the atmosphere is changing the size of the planet. Now, depending on the nature of the atmosphere, this atmosphere will be transparent or opaque. So essentially, you will see the size of the planet changing a little bit, depending exactly who you're looking at. And, and we're using these properties to do that. When the planet goes behind, it's very interesting as well because you only see the star at that moment. So the light you have entering your telescope, you're sure it's only the star. And if you wait the moment when the planet get out just behind, start to be visible, at that moment, if you have the right accuracy in your system, you will see a bump into the data. You will see a little more light because you will see the light from the star plus the planet. It could be the thermal emission from the planet. It could be just like the moon, the reflection from the light from the moon. And you use that to find out what amount of light is coming from the planet itself. To give you a feeling about this atmospheric um, and how we measure the atmosphere, I'm, I will show you a couple of images to get a feeling of this. This is, this is what you would see if you're flying the ISS and you take your cell phone in the visible to take a picture. So you just pay attention to the size, just always good to remind ourselves of the size of the atmosphere on the Earth. The biosphere is only 10 kilometers, very tiny, and even more five, six, 6,000 uh, meter here, compared to the 6,000 kilometer of, of, the, of the planet Earth. So the atmosphere is very, very tiny. We're talking about something which is a ratio of one over thousands of the size of the planet. Very, very tiny, like a, like a little bit of a peel here. So pay attention to the moon because it gives you the scale. So the very same picture at the very same moment that you take with another camera, which in this case would be infrared camera. Infrared camera have the privilege to see the thermal emission from the, the, the surface of the planet. If you pay attention, you will see it will give you a planet slightly smaller because you don't see the atmosphere. If you go back before, you see here, you have the atmosphere, it, sorry, and, and here, very sensitive, and here you see um, the, without, without the atmosphere. Uh, so using the same moment with another camera will give you a slightly smaller planet. It's the 6,000 kilometer without the 10 kilometers of the atmosphere. Now, if I use a very specific camera that is going to look at a wavelength that will be a bit farther in the infrared, which is tuned to the ozone band, in that case, I would see this much bigger planet. Why? Because this color, this wavelength, is going to be absorbed by the ozone. And the ozone is sitting at 50 kilometers above the atmosphere. So in that case, the size of that planet will be the 6,000 kilometers plus the 50 kilometers because I'm looking at the ozone. So by using this trick, changing the color or the wavelength where you're looking at the transit, you are scanning the composition of the atmosphere. And uh, I want to show you a, a very recent result from one of my colleagues here in Cambridge that 
is changing completely the game into what we're doing. This is a Neptune-sized planet observed with the James Webb Space Telescopes. What you do see here on the horizontal axis is the color or the wavelength that you observe this event. On the vertical axis, that's the amount of light that is blocked or this give you the size of the planet, essentially. And the point you see, don't pay attention to the blue line right now, just the point you have with the arrow bars or the measurements being made at different color, different wavelength at this very moment. And you see it's not flat. It goes up and down, up and down. There are troughs, there are peaks, because we are scanning the molecules into the atmosphere. So you can solve that problem and try to find what is the best way to understand this, um, this diagram. It's called a retrieval technique. It's kind of sophisticated. That brings a, you need to bring an atmospheric model into the planet. And you find this kind of blue uh, curve, which is here. I mean, there's way too much detail on that. It's just the idle model that you can fit. And what is interesting is to understand what it means. You see you have really ups and down here, which correspond to specific molecules into the atmosphere. And you do recognize names, methanes, carbon dioxides, uh, and then there is something a bit more strange, which is dimethyl sulfate, which is, a, which, is a, um, which is a molecule which is used in biochemistry. So I show you this because this was a shock when people saw that, because you're not expect to see methanes and carbon dioxide into a Neptune-like planet. Why? Because a Neptune-like planet is supposed to be essentially a core with a huge atmosphere of gas. And because of the huge atmosphere of gas, you have dredging in and out. Material is just sinking down the planet and coming back up, which would destroy a lot of these molecules. So you cannot have them like that in the planet. The only way to explain that is something that would prevent this block of gas to sink down and to get destroyed. So what this can be? A surface. So it was a shock to realize that that planet that is called a high sea end is actually a, possibly a rocky planet with a huge atmosphere that contain, that contain in that case, water. Because that's one of the um, conclusions. When you solve the model, you realize there is water behind it. So we're talking about a planet, potentially, that is an ocean of water with uh, some molecule that you see on the top. And there's a couple of predictions here, what you would see if you go more in the blue and more in the red, and people are working on that kind of uh, planet right now. So nobody would have guessed that, because a Neptune is supposed to be a planet that is not interesting. This object is so interesting right now that people consider that it's worth a little bit of time of study to see whether if you do have some biology going on on the planet, you can sustain it. It seems crazy, right? I'm mean, just talking about alien, right? No, alien world here. So the reason why I wanted to show you that is this is the reality of astrophysics. So we do things, and then sometimes you have, because you have so, you're so limited into what you could see in the solar system compared to the diversity what you have, you have to just change a bit of your perspective. And by doing that and by showing you this picture, which is one, one the very first one of many that's going to come in the next couple of years, we gently leaning to something even bigger that changing a perspective about finding planet. We're talking about finding life in the universe here, gradually moving in those directions. We can't resist because when you start getting this, you, can, you start having dimethyl sulfide, how do you do that? And there has been claim also of a discovery of interesting molecule in Venus because the idea of to look for maybe traces of ancient life on Mars, all this goes together. So there is this motion using now the fact that we're detecting planet and having data. It's not that it's talking, it's data. We have to face the question of life. So to move into the directions, I have to go back a little bit and talk about the only place when we know for sure there is life, which is Earth. Because it's still the landmark we use as a reference. And, and we, we have to be careful with references because we know how we can be tricked here. But still, it's still something is good to understand. So what I want to try to convey to you is the way we tend to see Earth is a very static way, because this is what we see today. Well, we're changing, okay, the atmosphere, global warming, all this. But compared to the whole history of the Earth, this is nothing compared to the evolution that happened on Earth. And the reason why I want to show you that is, depending on the time you look at the Earth, it's a very classic diagram for Earth scientists, when they kind of break the Earth in like a clock, 
they start at the bottom here, they don't start at the top, they start at the bottom at six o'clock and they make the planet, the planet is hot, there's a lot of material falling on the planet and there's an evolution, the heavy material is sinking down to the core and then you cool down, a lot of um, cometary impact with a lot of carbon is injected into the planet. That is why we have so much carbon uh, into the planet. Uh, it's falling there and you end up with uh, cooling down and having the core, the initiate, the magnetic field with a planet made of CO2, SO2 and then water there. And then at some time, at a specific moment, about 500 million years after you've made the planet, you see life. And um, it takes a bit of more time, it, it takes at least two billion years to really have a massive impact and to change the atmosphere and then to completely modify the atmosphere that you CO2 moving into O2. Uh, that's what we have today. So I'm mentioning this as because as an astrophysicist, this different phasing you have here corresponds to different atmosphere, really different atmosphere. They're not just a tiny detail here, just massively different. Now we do have planets that are maintained on high temperature because they're very close to the stars. We call lava worlds, or some of them that are medium temperature, that we do think they may be in a situation to produce similar conditions that the Earth experienced in the past. And for that reason, the question to ask is, if I translate this model that we have on Earth uh, into atmosphere feature, uh, does it mean we can see that? And, and that's the exercise being done here on the right, when the um, translation into what is the nature of the planet and what it looks like if you use a telescope and you just look at the light or the transit, similarly to what I did, you would see exactly the same way molecules, peaks, trough, corresponding to specific gas. Now, depending when you look at you have a different story. If you look at the Archean Earth, you see there's a lot of uh, CH4. We, 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 we gained the same molecule we've seen just before. And of course, if, if, if when you start having the life, life, the Earth has changed, but there is not yet a massive amount of oxygen. It's just a massive amount of water that you do see. It's a proterozoic Earth, and then the modern Earth with a lot of oxygen you see right now. So, I show you that to just demonstrate that the change that's happening on the atmosphere is huge uh, due to the modifications that happen on that planet. First, the planet itself that has its own evolutions and there is reaction between uh, what you have in the atmosphere and what you have inside and there is a dialogue between the two. I mean, the cycling of the CO2 is one of them. But also, in the case of the Earth, the impact of something else of the biology that is going to change completely the situations. So this is really the idea here. So we do think that by observing planet and an atmosphere of planet, sooner or later, we will have to face this. And we will have to deal with the question of life on the planet. So how do we fit in this? How can we bring all the dots here? What can we really do on that? So to move in these directions, I have to start to talk about this. Uh, philosophy, a kind of philosophical perspective here, because we don't have much data. We just have a principle, right now, of the data. Well, the first point is, I would like to go back to uh, uh, one of former uh, Nobel Prize, Christian de Duve, that is a biochemist. They used to work on related stuff about life. Christian de Duve has this very strong statement uh, that, to me, had a kind of deep impressions. This is, okay, life is there on Earth, but it means it has to happen. It's part of the encryptions of the universe. So it is an obligatory manifestation of matter. So in a way, you, because we have matter, because we have chemistry, we must have life. It comes as a product of the chemistry that is happening on the planet. There's nothing magical that you must make life. Well, the fact you make life doesn't mean life will stay. That's another element. That's why I was mentioning Mars and Venus. And we can imagine Mars, the life happened as well on Mars and Venus at the beginning and just went away. And we can imagine that maybe someday life will stop on Earth. But the idea you can make it, I think, is encrypted. As a physicist, I love that. Why I love that? Because if I look, I look back into the history of the universe, it's not very different. Think about the beginning of the universe. It's, uh, it's a very spectacular moment, but how boring is the universe at that moment? Hydrogen, gravity, 
photons, neutrinos. Not very much. It's not very exciting. You don't do very much with that. Well, the good news is you make stars. By making stars with the gravity, then you're making chemistry. Because the stars are producing all the elements of the chemistry. Every atom in your body right now has been made in a star. They are the machine. So the star is changing the game. But with only the stars, it's a bit boring because the chemistry in the cold atmosphere, in the, sorry, in the cold interstellar medium, doesn't go very far. You make a bit of alcoholic material, but not very much. What makes the chemistry really fun is because you have a planet. Because then chemistry experience a complete different situations. Again, you can dilute the chemistry, you can use water, you can use whatever you like, ammonia, anything you like. You can change the temperature, you can change the pressure, and then you open so much chemistry and you open the field of the biochemistry, and you make life. So in a way, to me, that makes sense. I mean, there's not much difference. Uh, building the idea of chemistry is just chemistry that's talking about the atoms are just the result of the star and the gravity. So the gravity makes the atoms. Well, the atoms make the chemistry. Chemistry makes life. It's quite logical. So it must be there. There must be a solution to that. Well, the problem is the only life we know is on Earth, and the life we know it is not easy to grasp. And the reason why is this. This is the tree of life bringing the time. Most often it's been shown without the time, which I think is a big mistake. And as an astrophysicist, you have to always to have to bring the time. The time is a bit cheating here because it's a log scale. So it starts from the, from the center, and the more you go to the outside, it's today. So today, and it goes slower, so one step, is very slow compared to the step in the middle. So you go very fast and then you go very slow. Now, what we see today is what is on the outskirts of this picture. It's the diversity of life. It's fascinating. I mean, when you see this explosion of life, actually the explosion of life is not that, that long in the past. I mean, it's only about half a billion years ago we have this explosion of life. For more, almost, life happens somewhere after one half a billion years, maybe one billion years, and for almost three billion years, it, nothing much happened, nothing spectacular. Of course, a lot happened because we changed the oxygen, all this, but the spectacular explosion of life is quite recent. And us, we're even more recent, we're just over there, if you look where we are, humans, on the, if you have good eyes, you see on the right here, we're right there. So, so what this is telling you about the beginning of life, that's difficult. I mean, it's the challenge. How could you find out, looking at the outside, what happened in the inside? Uh, because this is where we're talking about. Life is happening there. This is what we really do care, to see what's going on, early life. Now, the good news is it, it happened, but the bad news is it seems that there is no life happening right now on Earth. We're just replicating. I'm sorry to disappoint you. You just replicate. Creation of life is not happening. We don't see it, at least. We would love to see it. My colleagues, biochemists, looking at that, would love to do that, but they don't. So we don't have life happening. We don't have replicating very well. It's just an amazing mechanics, the way it's being done. And the reason why it's not happening is because at the time it happened, Earth was rather different. I mean, let me give you a picture that we think about all Earth was. About three billion years ago, this is what it looked like. There is no oxygen. We have a different atmosphere, possibly neutral. Uh, this is at that moment here. Maybe a lot more volcanic activity, a lot more material falling on the planet. It's a very different chemistry here going on. So the chemistry of life happens at that moment. So if you want to replicate the origin of life, you have to replicate that moment. You have to replicate the chemistry of that moment. But how sure do we know exactly the geophysics at that moment. How far do we know what exactly looked like the Earth at that moment? Not very much, because something on Earth is destroying everything. We have a time machine being destroyed by the plate tectonics, which is a good stuff because it recycles the CO2 at the same time. So plate tectonic is killing the memory that moment on the Earth. It's very difficult to find rocks that have survived without being transformed and melted and brought down into the mantle. Essentially, you are looking for the survival. You are looking for rocks that would be sitting like an island, always on the surface of the planet, and never get subducted. 
which so far has rarely been found. Now, of course, you can look at other planets as well and ask yourself, well, if I look at planet, other planets that have one billion years that looks like the Earth, maybe I will find out. And that comes the astrophysics here because technically we have millions of planets to look at. It's just a matter of telescope size here. So if you have enough telescope size, enough telescope time, enough stars to look at, and remember, we have 100 billion stars in the galaxy, so we can just pick the one you want. Uh, we can imagine building up this knowledge that we're missing. So we look back and try to compare how we're sitting and how may have been the Earth to then replicate the chemistry that is telling you the story about the origin of life. Of, of um, the origin of, the, of life on Earth. Now, how likely it is that in astrophysics we'll do that? Well, I think it's most likely because you don't break the law of physics by building equipment. It's just about the size of the equipment and the time to build the equipment. There's a very famous picture here that most of you should know, which is a blue dot picture, the famous Carl Sagan moment when he asked, I mean, they managed to convince one of the probe to return to take a picture of the Earth. This is the Earth, actually, in the solar system, just a dot. Um, I like this picture because I do think a picture like that can be made, but not looking at the Earth, which is done in the solar system, but looking at the planet orbiting under the star. If you start doing that, then practically nothing prevents you to analyze this picture. And this dot, you can analyze the light from this dot. And in that case, if you do that, you would find this. You don't need to have a high resolution to do that you find a lot of fascinating stuff. You would find the water, the oxygen, the CO2, and you would say, ooh, this is a very interesting planet. There's a lot of things that is happening on that planet. On that note, we're looking like that since two billion years. So if there is a very advanced civilization somewhere else, don't be worried. They already know us since two billion years. So I don't believe that stuff. We should not talk to other people. There's no way they know us already because we're visible. <laughs> we're so much visible. <laughs> it's visible there's life on that planet. I mean, this is what it is. Two billion years already. So, now this is possible to do, but you need a new generation of telescope. And the good news is we're building these new generations. I, let me just introduce you this new generation of telescope, the ELT. The size here is difficult to picture, but in that case, I'm lucky to be in this room because the size of the mirror that is going to be used with this machine is exactly the size of this room right now. And I was there one month ago. I can tell you, this is really impressive. With a mirror of 39 meters, which is about the size here, you can resolve a planet orbiting under the star on the very nearby stars. And that's the reason why this telescope has been built. And that's a telescope built by European South, Southern Observatories and all the European countries, including UK. Yes, UK is in Europe. <laughs> um, even Switzerland. <laughs> this, is, this is the kind of stuff we're going to do. And there will be that kind of image happening. So yes, we will be doing that. But we will be doing way more than that. And we're doing way more because you may be aware, and I'm pretty sure you do, that right now there are exploration of Mars. It already started some time ago, but what we are exploring is this region here, which is a very interesting region. It's kind of a change of the twist. And you don't need to be a planetary scientist to realize this is a typical region you would expect if you take a picture of a river, a river delta. And it used to be a river here and a lake. So yes. Mars was full of water. You have to go back in time, the first billion years about, they were full of water. They were lake, river. There's still water uh, on the, on the, underneath, but the water cannot sustain on the surface of Mars for a simple reason, because there is not enough pressure into the atmosphere. There is not enough gravity on Mars to maintain enough atmosphere, so there is no pressure. And you may know that the water has three states, the liquid, liquid is the middle one, but there is the gas and the solid. But to have the liquid state, you need pressure. If you get zero pressure, whatever is the temperatures, you're gone. You're gone either on the solids or on the gas. So you could not have water on the surface of Mars because as soon as it pop up, I think it becomes a gas and just escape the atmosphere of the planet. But this is a trace that we had water on, um, on Mars. And Mars is a planet that didn't have too much transformation. So it kind of get frost, and nothing really moved very much in that time. So we use it as a landmark how the Earth could have been if you go back in time. So I remember, I told you, we're trying to find out how Earth was at the moment life started. Possibly there is an answer to that. That's why we're obsessed by going to Mars. It's not to detect alien and Martian. I don't think there is any, frankly. 
but we're detecting traces or maybe ancient life, or maybe beginning of life, or maybe the beginning of the chemistry of life, or maybe a different kind of chemistry, or maybe we're going to find out that the chemistry of life started on Mars and moved back to the Earth. Who knows? That is exactly the reason why it would be so fascinating to go to Mars. But no, the challenge of all this is uh, bringing different disciplines together. I mean, chemistry, astrophysics, planetology, Mars explorations. And this is for that reason that when I started to work with colleagues, we realized that if we want to make progress, we're trying to get all this new data coming, because this is really new information coming to us. If you want to make sense into all that, we have to start together. So we had the idea to create a big joint program, and the one was mentioned in doing my nice introductions about the center we've set up. And this idea of this joint program are very simple. We want to bring these different disciplines, which is chemistry, planetology, and then and exoplanetology, and people doing astrophysics, together and try to build joint programs. So there's a lot of connection. You see, you don't have to read everything. But, but the, the central element is in the middle, you find life not exactly the same, or maybe something similar, but they're all telling you a fraction of the story. My best example is like going into a museum. If you go to a museum and you like a sculpture, and you go to modern art museum, sculpture modern art museum, usually they are quite challenging sometimes because you don't really understand what they, they mean, and, it's just, and you have to go around to understand. So clearly when you come to the sculpture, you get the first side of it, and you get some idea of the sculpture, but actually this idea is going to change, because when you move behind, you realize, oh, I forgot they were all this. So the picture is changing, because you see it from different angles. It's exactly the same here. Every us are seeing one angle. The chemists, they see life on Earth. The planetologists, they see life on Mars, and the impact of chemistry on life. The astrophysicists, they see the impact of more global on life, on the planet, on the atmosphere. They all have different bit of the story. None have the answer. But they all have the bit of it. So the idea we should work together. Of course, there's a lot of battle. There is a jargon. There is maintaining the communications, trying to build up joint communications, and also trying to battle some of the preconceptions. Sometimes we have preconceptions. Like the idea, when you start life, you have it. Don't think so. And my best, actually, actually my best assumption right now is you start life on plenty of planets as soon as you get minimum condition. And these conditions are easy to meet. But most of the time it fails because you don't have the condition to sustain. Because when you start life, you're so much depending on the, on the surroundings. It's a bit like being in the hospital uh, in the intensive care. You maintain a life because you have all this machinery around you. The more you evolve, the more you cut the machinery. And we are amazing because we got almost we got practically basic ingredients. Anything we eat, we break it. We break it to take the very core element and we rebuild everything. The machine we have, we make all the proteins, everything, so we are an amazing machinery that is constructing everything we need to stay alive. It was not the case at the beginning. At the beginning, I think to maintain something alive, very simple, you depend on a lot of elements together, and if you change a little bit, like this intensive care, you die. So, the possibility to life to strive, and even further, maybe to develop and to blossom the way we happen, it happened only in a half a billion years. Maybe this is very, very rare. But it doesn't really answer the question how this is starting. And that's a bit what we're talking about. And the philosophical preconceptions, I think, is affecting the definition at that moment. I want to end my, my talk with just, just a note. So we have this Live Home Center. There is some event which is public. Uh, please. Check the websites. We have conversation if you're interested by the topic. We have open conversation with also philosophers. We go from chemists, biochemists, philosophers, physicists. So we try to maintain this kind of diversity of thought. And uh, we started something which is the first, actually, in the world, uh, which is uh, an MPhil program, which is trying to bring this together, bring these different disciplines together. And this is going to start in October in Cambridge. So it's. Uh, it's a great place to be, and uh, some, sometimes people ask me, I mean, how come I stay in Cambridge after the Nobel Prize? Because this place is great. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Didier. That was a really inspiring, wonderful talk. Um, and thank goodness you have stayed in Cambridge. Um, <laughs> but interestingly, I mean, at, at a time when life on Earth for humanity can seem quite challenging, I thought what was so exciting and encouraging is to know that astrophysics uh, and your work in it is, is demonstrating to us the, the probability of life on other planets, um, and also the values you've just articulated so clearly of multidisciplinary science in order to do so. Um, so you've demonstrated, I think for me at least, the power and, and importance of the persistence in science, um, but also the challenges facing PhD students, some of whom are with us tonight, uh, but also shown us um, how to obtain a Nobel Prize for yourself and for your PhD supervisor. <laughs> So bear that in mind. <laughs> so please join us again next week. We're moving from astrophysics to art uh, with the art historian, critic and biographer um, uh, Francis Spaulding, um, who will speak about the quiet revolution in art. But please join me again to say thank you so much to you.